little preamble to both today's reading and today's sermon. Our uh, fourth UU principle calls for a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And today we'll be exploring the topic of music in light of that principle. You know, we often know music is something we enjoy, but we don't always understand why that might be meaningful to us. And so we're going to learn a little bit more about that. I was a little bit hesitant when I pulled up today's reading because uh, I ran across it and it was a, a blog posting by a teenager on a teen blog. And at first I thought, well, maybe that's not where we should go with this. But the more I thought about it, and I'm sure uh, many, if not all of you can relate, for most of us, our teen years are when we really started to strongly connect with music. Uh, when I think back on my own teen years, I can hear soundtracks, I can hear specific songs in the back of my mind as I'm, I'm thinking of those things. Um, you know, I, the experience of before you go out, you know, you put on some really high driving loud uh, song on the stereo with vinyl records, I'm old enough to talk about that, uh, where your parents are constantly telling you to turn the volume down. Um, I remember going to a used record store and spending hours combing through all these cool old records and that, that was, you know, music was a big part of our lives then and so that's why I thought it'd be kind of neat to hear about music from a younger person. And so this is The Power of Music by Julia Martin. My heart's a stereo, it beats for you, so listen close, hear my thoughts in every note. This is a verse of the new hit song Stereo Hearts that has been stuck in my head for the past three days like a permanent tattoo. Although I often get annoyed at the fact that I can't stop murmuring this poem, I know that when I get lost in the fast-paced song, my feelings and thoughts change, and I relax and become peaceful. Music has always been an important of my, part of my life, whether listening to it on the radio, practicing my clarinet, or even composing songs in band class. I've always had a passion for music, and it was not until a couple of years ago that I realized that music wasn't just a sort of entertainment, but is actually an incredible tune that has made me who I am today. Music is really another piece of literature, one that moves your emotions, sets the tone in a movie, and sometimes just enables you to let loose. Have you ever watched a really chilling movie, one that you just can't bear to watch anymore, so what do you do? You turn off the volume. Then suddenly the movie is not horrifying at all. Well, that's because the music that played in the background really set the tone and made you want to scream, but without it, the movie really was nothing. Music can not only change one emotion that you have, but it can transform your whole entire mood. Sometimes I have a really awful day at school, but as soon as I get into my car and blast the radio to my favorite melody, I just forget all my worries, and then all of a sudden I am beaming with joy. Another thing music does to people is get them motivated. You pass a gym or people along, walking along the road, and they always seem to have their iPods plugged in and streaming with catchy lyrics. On the flip side of getting people hyped up, music can also help people calm down and concentrate. I know that whenever I'm doing my homework, I turn on the radio, or when I'm taking a test, I hum a little tune. Or even when I'm falling asleep, I often listen to a low, relaxing harmony. Other than changing someone individually, music can also change a whole group. Music unites people. You could be singing a symphony in the glee club, or like me, join the school band. Either way, you are uniting together, expressing yourself, and creating new friends that will last a lifetime. Another outstanding thing about music is it can instill love. For many people, the song that they dance their first dance to at their wedding is the song that they remember forever, and whenever they hear it, it makes them fall in love all over again. Music is really one thing that the whole world has in common. We may all have our own opinions on the subject, but it does not matter because music is music, no matter where you come from. Even when I traveled to Ireland, I would hear Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, or even Taylor Swift being played from the speakers in local stores or homes. As people change, America changes, and technology changes, one thing I'm positive of is music will change, though music will never end. It is something that has such a dramatic effect in the way we feel, think, and work. I know that I won't put down my hairbrush and stop singing in the bathroom mirror, 
because music is in me and it has the power to make me change the way I think and feel. Thank you for having me today. I think I can just sit down now, Pam said, basically, uh, <laughs> what I had uh, uh, intended to say. Um, Gay asked me and Pam asked me to talk about uh, one particular strain of research I'm involved in uh, that deals with music, but Pam's reading today brought up another one which made me think about it a lot as well, um, and that is the role of music and identity. Um, I, I think what I'll say today will say, give you some idea of how, how and where that comes from. Um, but at any rate, let me just get started and see where we end up. As Pam's reading indicated, music can make our hearts soar, but did you know it can also make them work better? I didn't either until about two years ago when a chance conversation led to an introduction to a cardiologist at the medical campus of Augusta University. The cardiologist worked at the Georgia Prevention Institute and his research focused on preventing heart disease. I had just finished teaching an honors course on music and communication with a music instructor, someone fairly known, well known in Augusta because he's also a performing musician, Carl Purdy. And part of the course had looked at the effect of music on the brain. As Carl and I prepared that part of the course, he asked me if, I've ever, if I had ever heard of the science of somatics. I wonder, have any of you all ever heard of that? Okay, good. Um, and I had to admit to him that I didn't, I had not. Um, Carl and I had to present a paper in Miami about that time, and as we drove all those miles down I-95, he played podcast after podcast after podcast after podcast that dealt with semantics, which is the science of vibrational me medicine. Semantics, Carl and the podcast explained, maintains that the human body is a series of unified energy fields that, and that those energy fields vibrate. In energy medicine, Carl explained, physicians treat illness using music and sound, as well as other therapeutic measures. Carl, as a musician, of course, was particularly interested in the use of music to treat illness, and one of the things that, that he kept arguing is specific organs vibrate to different frequencies. So if you can get that organ this malfunctioning tuned back to the right frequency, you can heal it, which was kind of an interesting premise. And I have to admit that as a logical um, positivist who occasionally dips her toe into critical theory, I was, well, well, let's just say I was skeptical on good days and on bad days, I suspected Carl of being something of a kook. And I can say that about him because he's a really good friend. Um, and I wondered what the heck I'd gotten myself into with him. But on the other hand, I knew full well that I had used music to heal the psychological trauma that resulted from a devastating and apparently misdiagnosed physical ailment. So I couldn't be entirely skeptical of something I knew from personal experience worked, at least in a broad brush kind of way. Carl and I were relying rather heavily for the music and health section of our class on Daniel J. Levithan's award-winning book, This Is Your Brain on Music, um, which many of you may have read. It's several years old now, but it's still worth reading if you haven't. Levithan, as some of you may know, is not only a musician, um, a sound engineer, and a record producer who's worked with the likes of Stevie Wonder and Blue Oyster Cult. He is also a well-published and very well-respected neuroscientist. Levitin discussed cymatics, though he didn't use that term or make reference to its founder, Hans Jenny, in his study of the effects of music on the brain. And he gave the, cre the theory some credence. So I had to conclude that maybe Carl was on to something. Maybe my experience was not just me thinking music had helped me through a really rough time. Maybe it really had contributed to healing me. So when the call came out for interdisciplinary teams of researchers from the Somerville campus and the health science campus at AU to work together, I mentioned to the organizer that Carl and I were finding there could be some connection between music and its communicative aspects and health that might make for an interesting exploration. That led to an introduction to Gaston Capucu, the cardiologist I mentioned before, who is a pianist himself, 
and to some research administrators who happen to have some money after a good deal of pleading, um, and some other resources, and who thought the idea we'd come up with was pretty neat. Neat enough that they were willing to give us a little bit of money to do a pilot study. The idea we eventually developed brought together research Gaston was already doing and research Carl and I were doing. Gaston's research involved studying individuals as they played video games. And he noticed anecdotally that different people had different cardiovascular <laughs> reactions to the games they played. The reactions did not seem to relate, be related to the conduct of the game, but to the background music. He said he had seen African-American male teenagers stressed out by classical music, but soothed and hence achieving a lower heart rate and blood pressure when they substituted hip-hop music. I know that sounds stereotypical, but science can't be wrong, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that another day. Um, he had noted also an opposite reaction among white middle-aged men. That led us to postulate a cultural component to the influence of music on health, which is where Carl and I were working. Um, and we have not delved into that deeply yet, but it will be explored in the next phase of our research when we find a funding source. Our starting point, though, was trying to find out why and how music has its influence on the cardiovascular system. We knew from Gaston's research and from multiple other studies that music reduces, reduces stress, but no one knew exactly why. What was the mechanism? Why does the body respond to music with reduced stress? And that's what we wanted to know. We believed that answering that question was the cornerstone of what we proposed to do in our long-term plan. If we understood the underlying physical mechanisms by which music lowers blood pressure and heart rate, we believed we could use that, eventually in combination with the cultural component, to create what we're calling essentially a musical gamma knife that could be exactly tailored to each individual patient's unique physical and psychological profile and thereby achieve the maximum healing effect. We're still a long way from that but we're closer than we were because we've now completed our pilot study and our results were actually quite interesting. Because this was a pilot study with very limited funding, we worked with only a handful of subjects, 16 to be exact. The subjects were equally divided among male and female and African American and white. We wanted to catch some cultural data if we could and they were all between the ages of 18 and 42. Each subject came in twice, once for an experimental visit and once for a control visit. Each visit lasted for an hour. For the control visit, they would rest for 20 minutes, perhaps watch a bit of television or a movie, or perhaps sit quietly, if that was their choice. Then we would stress them for 10 minutes by subjecting them to an oral mathematics quiz. So let's see how well you do. What is, and, and you, you have to answer immediately after I ask the question. So what is seven times four minus 320, I'm sorry, minus 342 plus 37? You can see how that could, yeah, number, that's a good answer. You can see how that would be a little stressful if you have to go through 10 minutes of that and you're expected to have the answer immediately as the question is answered, or asked, rather. The subjects would have only a few seconds to answer before we moved on to the next question. <coughs> In the experimental visit, after 10 minutes of math, we would have the subjects rest for 20 minutes and then listen to 30 minutes of music. And it was not just any music. It was music Carl composed specifically for our study. He based his composition, which he called Galactic Sailing, and which I hoped to have to play for you all today, but he left for Peru yesterday and he didn't send it to me before he left. Um, Carl went to the literature and actually read up on what the literature says the active music attributes of music are that make it relaxing. And he then used those attributes to compose this piece. So this piece is specifically composed according to what science says <coughs> is relaxing. And it actually seemed to work. The piece will actually make you want to go to sleep if you listen to it. Uh, we recorded the music at two different frequencies. We were going back to cymatics here to see whether that cymatic effect was present. According to cymatic effect, the human body vibrates at a frequency of 432 hertz, which is, if y'all know music, the A above middle C. Okay? I'm sorry, I'm wrong about that. It is 
that's what we're, that's where we tune to now. The eight, so four thirty two would be right about middle C. Okay. To have the most dramatic effect on health, then the instruments should be tuned to four thirty two megahertz. However, as of about the, um, sometime in the nineteen twenties, when the musicians' union in New York decided a tuning standard was necessary. Instruments have been tuned to 440 megahertz, which is that A above middle C. Carl's contention is that the music we listen to may be making us sick because it's vibrating at a higher frequency than our bodies. Hence, it's stressing us unnecessarily whenever we listen to music. We actually found no support for that theory, but we only tested 16 people, so who knows? We may yet. Our findings, though, were interesting. Listening to music did not influence blood pressure in the way we anticipated. It did, however, bring heart rate down, and it increased the secretion of a hormone called oxytocin. The latter finding is perhaps the most interesting one. Oxytocin, sometimes referred to as the love hormone, is made in the hypothalamus. It is the hormone most commonly associated with childbirth and breastfeeding. Those of you who are mothers, if you've breastfed, you know the feeling of well-being you get when you're breastfeeding your baby? That's because oxytocin's released um, when you're doing that. So oxytocin is what makes us bond with our children, um, what makes us feel secure and contented. In other words, it's a feel-good hormone, and listening to music causes our brains to secrete it. Our cardiovascular findings were a little disappointing, but because of the small number of subjects, they were not statistically significant, which is good for us. Um, we hope to see a difference when we have the opportunity to work with more subjects. We believe the reason heart rate slowed is that when people listen to music, their heart rates tend to sink to the music they're listening to. This would account then for the slower heart rates because the music is at a very slow tempo. Um, we believe the blood pressures did not go down because the subjects had rested before they listened to music and we believe that they had achieved homeostasis. Once your blood pressure gets as low as it can go, nothing we can do to you can make it go lower. Well, short of drugs, I suppose. Uh, so, in other words, after 20 minutes of rest and then listening to music, the blood pressure was as low as it could go. So we think we have an explanation for that. So our results did not give us a new treatment for blood pressure, not yet, at least. We need to test more subjects. But it did show us that if we listen to music, we'll feel better will be in a more positive frame of mind, which is, I suspect, a precursor to bringing blood pressure down. After all, the more stressed and unhappy we are, the greater the likelihood our blood pressure will be high. So if nothing else, we found out why music helps reduce stress. We will continue our quest to see if we can find a way to use music to improve cardiovascular health by lowering blood pressure. In the bigger picture, I think what we found is that humans need music. Never, according to Dr. Lovaton, has any culture anywhere been discovered that hasn't left some evidence that music had a place in its society. The pre prehistoric flutes carved out of animal bone, drums made out of skin, gourds filled with seeds, all of these instruments have been found associated with virtually every culture we've discovered through archeological research. The instruments may be rudimentary, but they existed. Further, some scholars have postulated that the first form of speech was actually singing. It's much easier to convey meaning through pitch and rhythm than just through guttural sounds, which is what we have before thought was the first form of speech, or even gesturing, because gestures are, let's admit it, useless if you're separated from your partner by a cusp of trees or a great big huge animal of some sort, you can't gesture, right, because you can't see anyone. But singing with pitch and rhythm, you could say danger, even if you didn't have words for it. Maybe if Hans Jenny and the other cymatic scholars are right, that the body vibrates to a particular frequency, we could even argue that music is essential to human life and to human health, as essential as water, as, this, as an essential element of human makeup just like water. If that's so, then the work Carl Gaston, our graduate assistant JD, and I are doing cannot help but eventually to be fruitful. In some ways, it already has. Music makes us happy. 
We know that. It's like, it makes us feel like we feel when we're, we're cuddling a baby because music is in us and music is of us. When we hear it, our bodies excrete oxytocin in response. That's how a scientist might explain it. Hans Jenny would say when we hear music, it hits organs that are supposed to vibrate at a certain frequency and recalibrates them to health. Personally, I would say music is a gift from God, the universe, the eternal, the great spirit, the goddess, whatever your faith tradition postulates. It is a gift that brings us joy, lessens our sorrows, and restores us to mental and physical health. Through music, we can heal our social, emotional, and even physical ills. Through music, we can orchestrate wellness. Thank you.